it is one of the most difficult things and it, it is easy to get it wrong, right? Especially if you haven't worked through your own things. And really that's the intention we have with today's podcast is we know it's hard. It's never too late to edit your parenting style. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. Today we're going to talk about parenting and some of the common mistakes that parents make among some other things. Parenting can be one of the most rewarding frustrating, heart-wrenching, and fulfilling endeavors, and it can be all of those things in one day. (laughs) When newborns arrive, we're over the moon, followed by a period of sleep deprivation that lasts about three years. I mean, we still have kids in our bed. Are you still sleep deprived? I am. I am. There's lots of kicks and snoring. We've all heard the analogy, secure your oxygen mask first before helping others. But that excellent advice buys out the window when an infant arrives. We don't sleep. We don't eat. Sometimes taking a shower feels like an impossibility. I remember when David was born, our first, he was so young, he was 24, uh, just turned 25. And um, I remember I I was home alone with him. He was probably a week old, maybe two weeks old. And I had put him to sleep. I had fed him and it was like the afternoon. I'm like, okay, I can finally take a shower. I jump in the shower and I hear him screaming at the top of his lungs, like wailing, like screaming. And I'm like rushing. I'm like, oh my God, my child, he's crying. He's left alone. I come out. He's sound asleep. I heard, it, I hallucinated it. It would never even happen. That's a common thing that happens with new first time mothers. Yet we begrudge them nothing. We're generous. We'd sacrifice anything for our infant. Our love is unconditional. We care so much about their emotional state as a small child. Do they feel loved? Did I hug them enough? Did I tell them that I love them enough? Do they feel safe, secure? Are they fed? Are they nurtured? When they're little, we care so much about being a good parent. As they grow, it changes. And as parents, we adapt in ways we aren't usually even aware of because it's such a gradual change from being wholly dependent on us to becoming more and more independent. Lots of parents struggle with this because they're not necessarily paying attention to this ever evolving, changing relationship. It changes every stage. With their stages, as they grow and change, the relationship must change. We think about what kind of parents we wanna be. We read a ton of books. But about those books, social psychologist Elizabeth Kagan reviewed contemporary parenting books and concluded, I thought this was fascinating, that they mostly reflected a blanket acceptance of parental prerogative with little serious consideration of a child's needs, feelings, or development. Now, I think there's newer books today that consider the child, but most of the parenting books were very much in that one-sided kind of perspective. The dominant assumption, she added, seemed to be that the parent's desires are automatically legitimate. And thus, the only question open for discussion was how exactly kids could be made to do whatever they're told. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Well, These books focus... That. What? I strongly disagree with that. That perspective. books? Well, no, 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 no. That with that perspective. Of right? course. Yeah. No, no. I strongly disagree with it too, but she said that she found that most of the parenting books had that that tone and that perspective. Um, a lot of cultures are like that. Do you remember when we were in London many, many, many years ago? Um, we didn't have Abigail yet. And uh, David, he didn't, he didn't like to sit still, you know, very curious. All our kids are curious, but he was, you know, kind of all over the place. And we were in London and culturally, you know, children are supposed to be seen not heard for the most part of course i don't want to make like a blanket statement but we were getting a lot of looks on that train right because that's not how we parent he was really curious and really excited i think it was the first train he'd ever been on but those stairs and i was really like i felt i was uncomfortable that they were that they were staring but i was never uncomfortable with what david was doing right but i think a lot of people respond to that do you remember that right vaguely So these books focus on obedience because a child who listens and does what they're told makes parents' lives easier. But if you ask parents what their goal is for their child, they say things like, I want them to be independent thinkers. I want them to be resourceful. I want them to be happy. I want them to be critical thinkers who know what they believe. I want them to be resilient, strong, and able to weather life's challenges. So isn't it interesting that of all these higher level goals seem intrinsically at odds with obedience? It begs the question, where do we expend most of our parenting energy when they're young? Is it on controlling their behavior or is it on stilling, or is it instilling those higher level values? So there's a lot to discuss. And I think that of course, 
again, if you ask the parents their wish list for their child, it would be that, right? But well, I, I wonder sometimes, right? I mean, that's kind of our perspective, but I wonder. I mean, I, I mean, I, successful, I'm sure. We, we were actually having this conversation the other day. We know, you know, many people, many parents, and I am sometimes shocked by how poorly parents focus on kindness as one of the most important virtues, one of the most important ways with which you want your child to grow. A lot of adults aren't that kind. Well, true. <laughs> and they but weren't raised with that. Possible, but 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 as parents, I think, you know, obviously we're not talking about you know when you're one year old, two year old, three year old, but but as kids get older, I don't know how much um, focus is given to the fact that is my child growing to be a kind human being. I wonder how often parents are asking themselves the question: Am I? helping my child grow to become a kind human being. right? Because I think, again, often, you can make generalities in this, but I think parents want their children to be successful. What does that mean? They go to good schools, they get good jobs, make good money, they find good wives, husbands, whatever that is. Respected. Right, but but I think, and this, I think, is where a lot of the conversation today will go, the most important focus of parenting should be to to grow or help grow children that are, in our terms, spiritual, and that necessarily means kind and and outward looking. And I think too often in the focus of parenthood, we don't sometimes you know maybe if you're a little bit spiritual, you give it you'll give it the five percent, ten percent. In reality, you know, good probably sixty, seventy, if not eighty percent of parenthood focus should be. Is how is my child developing as a spiritual, as a spiritual being? How how are they developing as a kind being? How are they growing to be that? And like I said, we know very many very you know what would call them good parents. You know they send their kids to the best schools and they you know they take care financially in what every way that they can to their children. But do you see time after time, child after child, the child is not a kind child. And you ask yourself the question again. Of course, children always have free will, and you never want to judge parents on the way their child necessarily grows. But um, if if you're if you're at a hundred percent, you know, failure rate where your children might be going to the great best schools and they might and so on and so forth, but they are neither spiritual nor kind. I think that's a big red flag. Well, so, it's complicated because a lot of parents are still struggling with finding that for themselves, right? Um, so I think one mistake in the vein of what you're speaking of, one mistake parents make is that they focus on behavior or control, right? Instead of the more important part of because right? control and behavior, it's again that outward. What does this look like to the world instead of what's really going on internally? So eventually these these little obedient children or not so obedient children become adults, husbands, wives, mothers, and fathers to their own children. But the role of the parent hasn't ended. Right, we need to change and edit our parenting approach. So I think that's part of it too. I think we, most parents think that a lot of it is, you parent to a certain age, which is making sure that they're safe, that they're fed, that they go to school, that they're getting education, and it's kind of more of a robotic way of parenting. Right, the needs needs they're automatic, they're urgent, and then when the kids become eventually a little more independent and more and more independent. I don't know what kind of thought goes into this other part that we're speaking about, right? And and this happens to be the most important part. I mean, so many times parents are like, "I'm so exhausted. I have five kids under the age of four or five. Um, <laughs> that, yeah. Well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I have five quizzes, kids. Yeah. I have five kids under the age of six, um, and they're exhausted. And I'm just thinking, you wait till those children are all now teenagers, right? And really, what's going to happen then? That's when their needs. Are are the most important, but of course they mirror what they see. Right, and I think related to that is also another big mistake that parents can often fall to, which is seeing the child as an extension of me, and my desire for them to grow is as it reflects upon me, and probably one of the most important decisions consciousness that the parents need to have is that 
The child is not me. This, this child, this soul, is an independent being. And I should never be thinking about how their growth, development relates to me, but rather, what is best for them. Whereas, you know, worrying about how my family and friends and neighbors view my child, right? How many people, you know, I'm so proud. And again, not that there's anything wrong with being proud. Your child made it into this great school, or got this great job. But, but it has to be for the right reasons that you're feeling that. It has to be for them, not for you. Exactly, because they feel, or you know how hard they worked and how much it means to them versus do you look like a good parent or not. Right. Because I think, go back to your point about obedience, one of the reasons why parents are so focused on having their children listen to them is because then it makes life easier for them, right? A child that's not obedient makes it more difficult for me. But babe, one second, maybe that's what's best for the child. Not always, right? But maybe that's what's best for the child. And is that your perspective, right? Is that the way you're you're growing as a parent, which is to try to disassociate yourself as much as possible, or I would say more importantly, your ego as much as possible from his or her, your child's needs and, and development and growth. And unless unless we're constantly acting upon that, right, with the understanding that my child is not mine, right? He or she is given to me a soul to help develop for them, and maybe for the world, one could say, but definitely not for me. Unless that's a constant thought, then the decisions that I make, and the way I go about my my daily parenting, cannot be in its most, I would say, perfected way, or in its best way possible. And by the way, let's just give credit to all the parents out there. Parenting is really hard. I don't think it gets enough acknowledgement of how difficult it is, because you've never done it before. You're thrown into this full-time, very important, very serious job that is is life for another, but also it affects your life so completely. It is one of the most difficult things, and it, it is easy to get it wrong, right? Especially if you haven't worked through your own things. And really, that's the intention we have with today's podcast is we know it's hard. It's never too late to edit your parenting style. Right, even by, by the no way. No matter what age your child exactly, is. Exactly, even if your child's 40 years old. Yes, exactly. Like, and, I think, and I think that's a very important idea, right? Because obviously, as you said, parenting runs the gamut from zero to 100. Literally, your, meaning your children can be. Um, and, and, and sometimes the thought is, oh, I messed up, you know, when they were teens, you know, my, not, nothing more I can do. No, like you often say, your kids actually need you more when they're 18, 19, 20, and they probably need you just as much when they're 30 and 40 and 50. And the thought can sometimes be, well, I messed it up. You know, no, you can actually become a great parent at any age, to any age child. And by the way, I've seen that. I've seen parents where, you know, for whatever reason, different parts in their lives, either they were too busy working and so on, but they decided, you know, my child's 25 years old now, and I wasn't a great parent until this age, but now I will be. And that knowledge that I can become a better parent, uh, certainly a more present parent at any age, is an important one. And conversely, if you were a very present parent when your children were up until the age 19, and then you decide that you want to have your own life and you're tired of parenting, you know, you can't really check out then either because that's really when they need you the most. I mean, I think from ages 20 to 30, usually children kind of step away from their parents or living their life until they become parents and they come back to the parents to like help me Mm -hmm. with my kids. But I I think that it's human nature to go through many feelings around this and, and wanting to be all in and sometimes not. Um, but it's important to think ahead of, you know, really who you want this, how you can influence this soul and what is your responsibility and what ways to do that. You know, I read so many articles, um, and some of the things, the styles of, of parenting, like one parent, this child saw another kid eating a cookie and the mother said, well, yeah, he gets a cookie because he knows how to use the potty. I mean, sometimes shame is used. Sometimes we withhold love. So I'm going to bring all of this to the forefront because again, you can edit, you can change it, it's never too late to to adapt. Yeah, so I would like to share, um, I think in a previous podcast, we might have mentioned this book, it is really a great book, called The Spiritual Child, by Lisa Miller. And a part of what she does is ex- explain scientifically, through studies, why developing a spiritual child is one of the most important tasks that we have as a parent. So, I am going to read a little bit uh, from her work. 
and I do recommend all of our listeners, certainly those of us who are parents, and again, parents at, at, at any age. So she says, I know childhood spirituality to be a powerful truth that is incontrovertible, yet strangely absent from our mainstream culture. So one of the, one of the findings of, of many, many different studies and research is that children are actually born with the capacity and the need for spirituality. Mm-hmm. That it's not just you know a spiritual ch- parent will have a spiritual child or a spiritual parent will will focus on it. Children are actually born with both with the ability and the need to well, we, we understand to live that a spiritual life kabbalistically. But what is she saying based on what is she expressing that? So that children are so spiritual is not merely an anecdote or opinion, it's be it mine or anyone else. It's an established scientific fact that the research they found that again that children are, are drawn to. Are drawn and in, in need of a spiritual life in order. So, I'll, I'll, I'll give. An, I just want to read two more. Meaning that they connect naturally to things that are spiritual, because well, I understand why we know that kabbalistically. I want to hear the science on it. And but is that what you're saying? They 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 watched. They viewed children. They saw them in their reactions to right. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, so so to that point. So I just want to. There's two more things that I want to. I want to really uh, quote from her. One, what does she mean by spirituality? Which I think is such a beautiful explanation, by the way, for adults or children. But I think it's a really important one because she's definitely not referring to religion, mm-hmm. and certainly not um, uh, rote following of religious practice. She says, and her quote, "What is when she speaks about spirituality or or, or the spiritual child who she's referring to?" An inner sense of a living relationship to a higher power, in parentheses, God, nature, spirit, universe, the creator, or whatever your word is for that ultimate loving, guiding life force, right? So, a relationship, being spiritual, a, child, a spiritual child means that the child has a relationship with a higher power. And that's something that we are hardwired as we are born into this world to develop. And as research shows, it actually um, inoculates children from so much of the anxiety and depression and making poor choices. I would imagine poor choices and drug use. Mm-hmm. They so the, uh, the the studies have proven this that a child who develops this sense of a relationship with the higher power in whatever way they see it are are by many orders of magnitude more protected. For example, from drug use and uh, a promiscuous sex. Uh, early age sex and all kinds of negative um, uh, aspects of childhood that or or, or teenagers that that people who are, do not have this spiritual foundation or sense do, are not protected from. You would it's, imagine that this would be like used for every kind of marketing for any like just to educate parents on this. Absolutely. Truth. So the point and the, this is it's her kind point. Of crazy her point is if not... you want to if you want to have a, a, the highest chance. Of a healthy, raising a healthy, well-rounded child, adult. make sure that your number one priority is for them to develop a spiritual connection, as she as she said. So, one more paragraph that I'd like to share. She says, "I believe that a new scientifically defined human faculty, which I call natural spirituality, which is a, fra- a, co- a phrase that she coins, is the next big idea for parents. Natural spirituality." We can now apply new research and data about spirituality's relationship to human health, happiness, and thriving to our understanding of child development and parenting. So the point is, whereas, again, uh, there are many categories of of where parents focus their attention as they're growing as parents, what she's saying is, number one, should be what she refers to as natural spirituality, or that spirituality we refer to, to develop for the child, to assist the child in developing that relationship to a higher power, a higher force. Well, if not, they're going to use that natural need and desire, and they're going to place it somewhere else, whether it's in friendships or that place of like, I need to belong, I need to be part of, I need to connect, right? You're going to go look for it elsewhere, not yeah, knowing that's probably really one what of the it reasons. is. Yeah, that's probably one of the reasons. Like, I know it saved me growing up, is that I, I did have that natural spirituality, and even though it wasn't encouraged in my home, for whatever reason, it was very strong well, but here, sign, in me. The, the studies show you are actually born with it. But I took it seriously, yes. and I, I held it, I held on to it. So, then when I deviated from that, I knew what 
I knew what I felt. I could not deny that. And I remembered it, right? I think that I've always say that's unusual that I remember at age four or five, really feeling a close connection to God. But I, I wonder if I didn't have that memory, right? I mean, right. It, it really did pull me back. And I went searching for it then when I was, um, or, you know, in late teens. Um, yeah, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Our findings show that natural spirituality exists as a human capacity, just as EQ and IQ are commonly acknowledged human capacities, and it is associated clearly with life success and satisfaction. So, incontrovertible proof that focusing your you said EQ and IQ, yeah, right, emotional intelligence right. and mm -hmm. intelligence and IQ, regular intelligence, um, right. So, so, right. By the way, before. I, I, everybody, IQ was one of the first, right? Everybody understood people have an intelligence. Now we're starting, now we right? understand there's EQ. And then, yeah, so the sort of, you know, relatively, relatively recently, it's become acknowledged that EQ is a quality that one has, one can develop. So what she's saying is as important and as scientifically provable as those two is what she calls natural spirituality, which means again that. It is. We know that IQ and EQ influence our life success and our uh, uh, happiness. So too does natural spirituality. Um, and again, so it's associated with clearly with life success and satisfaction. We now we now know that an inner spiritual compass is an innate concrete faculty, and like EQ, a part of our biological biological endowment. Right. So we're born with it. It has a biological basis which can also be cultivated. The, the evidence is hard, indisputable, and rigorously scientific. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there shouldn't be any doubt both on, on its existence, right, its biological, natural existence, and the studies also prove that it creates more successful, more satisfied adults. I wonder if for children, right, so all children have this, I wonder if they don't see it in the home, does it become less important? Of course. It's like, it, by the way, it's like intelligence, and it's by, like emotional intelligence. We are all born with the 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 Cap seeds of it, the capacity, capacity for it, and to develop it, of course. The, and it's heightened at that age. Yes, because it's natural, exactly. But of course, parents and or society can dim those 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 kids. Just like a, a doctor who sees blood day in and day out, or death, right? You become kind of numb to that because it's something that you experience every day whereas before maybe the sight of blood you know they'd have a different effect it's kind of like that right right um our children have an inborn spirituality that is the greatest source of resilience they have as human beings so this is also an important point so we know that resilience right the ability to bounce back is one of the most powerful lessons qualities we can inculcate in our children well the most powerful tool for a child to develop resilience is based on their natural spirituality or helping them tap into their natural ability to connect to a higher power. And then they will be more resilient. And science has proven that resilience is one of the most important, not just in children, but in adults, one of the most important qualities to be able to have a successful life. Yes, because then you can deal with failure and setbacks and, and step up again. Right. And we, as parents, can support our children's spiritual development. Our parenting choices in the first two decades radically affect our children's spiritual development. Okay, pause there for a second. So I want everybody to hear that two decades. Right. So it's not that it ends at eight or twelve, or it's two decades. Right. Your your child needs your influence, your involvement till they're twenty, and then again, then even on. But it changes. It needs forever. But I think that most parents stop way too early. Right. And more and, and some parents, maybe many parents, don't focus on the spiritual development of their child. Sure. And what she's saying here is that is that our parenting choices in the first two decades radically, again, this is proven by studies, radically affect our children's spiritual development in ways that they're la that last their entire lives. So, uh, one so she's more, saying parenting styles. No, how, how how we? By the way, a, a parent who does not certainly their parents who might even try to diminish their children's natural spiritual uh, awakening, and if we and if we do that, if a person does, if a parent does that, then it affects their child's spiritual uh, view 
and, and, and experience, not just in the first 20 years, but also for the rest of their lives. And it radically shifts. So before so all- you, you continue, though, I do want to just remind our listeners of a few mistakes that parents make. Um, I, sorry, just before before you, you continue, I think it's just so important. <laughs> it's just so important. You were interrupting me here, just so very clear. <laughs> well, you've been reading from a book for like 15 minutes. I'm trying to get a word in. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to under, underline, because this is so important, that... I think you're affecting my spiritual ability <laughs> right, right now, now for nurturing good, and fostering. Good, good, good. That's my goal. Yes. Um, that it is so wrong for parents not to take this seriously, and and to almost rob our children of an innate quality that they have, that we either diminish or don't allow to grow. It's still that that either lack of focus, or if it's done in a negative way, diminishment of of this quality of natural spirituality that children are born with. It's the worst thing we can steal from them. But it's I the think worst that I mean I'd assume that whoever's listening to our podcast is on some kind of spiritual path or has a spiritual interest. If a parent doesn't have a space in their adult life for spirituality, it's very hard for them to instill it in their home, obviously. Of course. Although I, one could argue that kindness is a form of spirituality, right? Any of those tendencies that bring you back to goodness are part of that. So I think even if you can't put it under the umbrella of spirituality. Right. Again, she, again, and she's well, coming from I, I'm a scientific... With her, I'm agreeing with her. I'm just she, trying to create some kind of opening. You're sure. being like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's kind of black and, and white. Let's say, yeah, but I do think it's kind of black and white. Again, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about spirituality. And, and the reality is, and I think most people are open to this. I don't think, you know, there's a, that that if you want to have the most successful child and the most satisfied child as they become adult, make sure not only that you're open to this, which I think most of our listeners, of course, if not all, are be completely open to it, but that it's it's up there, I would say, is your number one priority, if not in your top three. And I think even parents who are spiritual, quote unquote, whatever that means to them, they don't necessarily view that my number one job as a parent, my number one job as a parent, is to is to de- help develop this natural spirituality that my child has, and to nurture it, because this is their most powerful tool, greater than IQ, greater than EQ, of what kind of life they are going to have. That's so funny. One of the last things your mom said to me before she left this world, um, she didn't have a lot of time with Abigail. But funnily enough, she probably spent the most time with Abigail throughout Abigail's life than she did with the other grandkids, just because of the stage that of life Karen was at. Um, but Abigail was probably two and a half, maybe three. And um, you could already see that she was very similar to Karen in terms of really being uh, very aware of something greater and uh, tapped in, right? So I don't remember what Abigail said, but it was something spiritual. And Karen looked at me and she said, "Make sure um, you never, you never say or do anything that diminishes that or takes that away. Like, make sure you 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 foster this." And I remember thinking, like, "Why is Karen even saying this?" Of course, right? But it was really, you know, it's exactly what you're saying, but. We, you could see it, you know? Um, but I, I had a thought while you were speaking just now, and I think that, unfortunately, and again, parents don't mean to do this, but I think that most parents go into this with, I want to be the strongest voice in your head. I want to be the one that you listen to. I want you to follow what I'm saying. I know what's best for you. Sure. And it's almost like, right, the parent becomes their God. And again, I don't think any parent sets out that way, but that really is what happens. And the more that we insert ourselves, not just as a parent, but our beings, ourselves, our desires, in an ego way, the child, of course, then becomes further away from themselves, but also from the creator, because those two go hand in hand, and it becomes more about the parent. And I think that is probably the number one way that parents really That's a very important point. And and so... So the, what what the message to parents and from parents to children should be 
you have a powerful voice inside, and that ultimately should be what you listen to. Together, we are going to help develop. You mean to the child has. To the child, yes. right. That the child has. And together... And, that, and you don't want to be their God. Because exactly. a lot of parents raise children to to follow, right? They don't mean that. But think about this. If a parent brings a child into the world, listen to what I say, do what I say, why should I do that? Because I said so. You know, I hate that answer, by the way. And then they've raised this obedient child that is like a yes, ma'am, yes, sir, follows the parent. Then what happens when your voice is no longer the most important one, right? A child now is in high school or, you know, grade school, and they really want to belong, but they've been taught and they've been raised in a way that they should follow. They should follow the stronger voice. So now your voice, the parent, becomes replaced with the kids at school, and they follow that. And and what you're doing is you're really handicapping the child. Absolutely. And and to be clear, the message should be, right, as parents, and we should be having this conversation with our children, which is, you have a connection to this greater power. And my goal as a parent is to help you listen to that voice. In life, you'll be hearing many voices. You'll be hearing my voice. You'll be hearing your friend's voice. You'll be hearing your siblings' voices. The most important voice for you to listen to is your own true voice. Now, of course, it takes time to understand what does that mean, because even within an individual, there's a there's a what we call a positive inclination, there's a negative inclination, of course, but but to know that at our core we have access to and our pure voice is the most powerful one for us to be listening to. By the way, I think that it's never too if I think if you start that early with children, because I give this advice to parents all the time, they ask, you know, how do I guide my four year old, my five year old? And I often say, I don't think it's ever, I don't think they're ever too young to have this conversation. Even if they can't articulate, even if they can't answer it, just start asking the question. When they are stuck with something to do, what's right or what's wrong, you have to stop and say, well, how do you feel about this? What do you think? What feels like the right thing for you to do? Is this your happy voice or is this your sad voice? Right? And you can already start so that they start to become um, more internal rather than focusing on the external. So I, I think. We started that at a very young age with all of the children, and we have obviously developed that and expanded upon it as they got older. But it, it should start early. Right. By the way, this is important. I was thinking about it to all adults as well, right? I mean, unfortunately, I think one of our society's biggest problems is that we are so externally focused, and that the more every and by the, the way, more you are, the more your voice is muted and your connection to the creator. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. Um, I do want to point out some of the biggest mistakes that parents do sure. make because I think it's the opposite of um, this spiritual parenting. So there is the overbearing parent, right? The parent that um, comes in many flavors. They can make their, it's clear that they dislike their child's career choices, money management, spouse. By the way, I never get that one because if they choose to marry that person and you're already setting it up as like, you can't trust yourself to choose a life partner and I don't like them. You're already damaging the parent-child relationship. And again, if you were the voice in their head, unfortunately, all these years, more than anything else, more than their own, the creator, imagine then they're now married. Actually, I, I just worked with a couple like this. And because he's been raised to follow his mother's voice, now he thinks it should be his wife, but now he's confused because the wife doesn't have these tools yet. And then the mother's feeling slighted. And really, he has to learn to become a man and, and hear his own voice and connect more to the creator. So um, that's one, I think, big mistake. Another one is parents always stepping in to save the day, right? Not allowing a child to have, again, if the child never cultivates their voice or connection, how, how are they going to be able to navigate life, right? I think life is really scary when you never actually strengthen that part of you, because then it's just like, what's the flavor of the day? I'll listen to that today. I'll try that tomorrow. I'll try this other thing. I see it a lot with like dieting, right? People never learn to eat intuitively, never learn to listen to their body and the cues that their body gives them. Like, no, this doesn't feel good in your body, even though the fad diet says you should eat that, but it's not working for you, right? So you go from one thing to the other thing to the other thing, never really knowing, even though your body is yelling at you about what you should do. And you could take that with any part of you. Um, Another common mistake that parents make is withholding love, right? Withholding love doesn't teach anyone how to have healthy relationships. And it's a common parenting mistake. You know, um, yeah, I know many people, they won't speak to their children for a day or two. 
on purpose. Yeah, to get them to come back. And so now you'll listen to me because I've I've withheld this. Even I know I know children in their sixties that the parents are still withholding. Um and they're still responding to it. So the love of a parent is a need that every child has at every age and that never changes. So withholding is really never an option. Actually, withholding love weaponizes the basic human desire. Further, the way we model relationship doesn't end when our kids move out or go to college. Okay, and one more big common mistake that parents make is shaming their children. That's never effective. And I think that more often than not, parents do this, like that story of the child who wanted a cookie and said, well, you didn't get it because you don't know how to use the bathroom. I don't understand the connection between the two. Um, but then we are raised with any time we make a mistake, any time in life, we have such shame around it and it really paralyzes us. Shame should never be used as a way to parent. In conclusion, um, the best we can hope for is that our children will meet the world with principles and aspirations of their own, but they have to know what those are and they have to cultivate them early on. But I think we can strive to provide these without smothering. It's not an accident that the word mother isn't smother. And uh, and just to check ourselves where we really are, why, what motivates our our actions with our children, our advice, our guidance, or lack thereof. Um, is it about us or is it about them? And I think that if we have that honest conversation with ourselves, it's never too late. You have not damaged your child. Even if you have, you can edit and go back to really saying, okay, well, where where have I not offered spirituality to them, you know, that and instilled in them that everything that they need to know exists within themselves, but they have to be able to find that. And to do that, they have to have a connection to where they've come from. Absolutely. And I would conclude with just one more quote from the spiritual child. Natural spirituality, in fact, appears to be the single most significant factor in children's health and their ability to thrive. So, as a parent, number one priority, how am I developing my child as a spiritual being? Because that, not just for spiritual, maybe forget about spiritual reasons, that will be the most powerful tool and development that you can give them to prepare them for a both a life that in which they are thriving, in which they are successful, in which they are happy. Because here's the thing, if you want your child to be able to identify something that isn't good for them, right? Whether it's Instagram or the wrong peer group or um, the wrong boyfriend or girlfriend, how will they be able to know that that's not good for them, right? Not that it's a bad thing overall, but it's not good for them. The only way they'll be able to know that is if they are very familiar with what is good for them, what does feel right, what is based on truth, right? You have to have that exposure and you have to have that continuous exposure experiences so then when you're introduced to other things that could be damaging, you're like, wait, this feels very far from this other great thing that I've had my whole life that's very familiar. Absolutely. And that's really the importance of it. Yeah. That's the thing that saves you. And in, in relation to that, everything we said before is that a spiritual child is one that is aware of their inner voice, in tune with their inner voice, listening to their inner voice. Otherwise, like you said, which I think is so important, is that if parents raise their children to listen to me, which is basically the message, always go outside of yourself. In this case, it's me. In the next case, it might be a wife, or it might be a friend, or it might be Instagram, or TikTok. So, a spiritual child means somebody, someone who is focused inward, and is... Right. The mother's saying, you can't trust yourself to make good choices for yourself. Exactly. So, what is that? What exactly. is that? How will that child ever thrive as an adult? Exactly, exactly. And but again, this has to be cultivated from age zero to age twenty and, and onward. But when you do that, you give them the ability to really shut out all those other voices that are often not for their benefit, more often than not. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to share a uh, an email we got from one of our listeners. Um, this is from Rissa, and she writes, Monica and Michael. Wow, what a great podcast. I'm a naturopathic physician, acupuncturist, practicing about 30 years. Right, where do you live? <laughs> I'm looking for one. <laughs> so maybe you can email us, email us a follow-up with your address. Uh, treating people of all ages, and the bulk of my patients, even if they initially come to me for low back, low back pain or digestive disorders, are suffering from debilitating anxiety, depression, and many are on medication. You are 150%, 150% spot on with each and every one of your points in your podcast, especially the humor approach advocated by Michael, as well as the spiritual component. 
I always try to send my patients out the door laughing, even if from a silly comment or even playing a Bee Gees tune for them to disco out the door to. I'm going to ask each of them now to listen to your podcast and then listen again and again. Indeed, all of my patients listen. If all of my patients listened to this podcast and took it to heart well, I'd lose 90% of my business. <sighs> always grateful to hear your wise words and humor. I love that. You know, I just had a thought actually. Yes. So yesterday I went to the dentist. I didn't tell you this part. Um, and anybody who knows me knows I have like, mm, don't love the dentist. I don't think anybody loves the dentist. Yeah, but I really Even just, dentists don't love dentists. Uh, okay. Um, also, because you just feel like a failure no matter what. Like, That's you. you never, I never feel like a failure. Well, you should. I mean, teeth, <laughs> an hour stained, gums. There's so many things. Roots. Uh, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll just have to agree to that one. Well, I feel like a failure. I'm, and, and then, of course, my um, nature is overachieving. So then, like, whatever. By the way, that thought is so foreign to me. <laughs> like, it's like... I believe you. I believe you. Oh, yeah. But... It's like, oh, then they give you numbers. And I'm like, what does that number mean? And this is risen and that's fallen. It's like, what's happened? Oh, my I know. So anyway, that wasn't the point of my story. <laughs> so um, I'm deciding between dentists and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm the whole time I'm giving myself emotional feedback. Like, do I think that I could trust her to drill into my teeth? I need some things done. And I'm assessing, right? And then the next thing she's like, oh, did you meet Oliver? And I kind of like, saw a dog. I assume that's what she was talking about. I was like, no, I didn't meet Oliver. She's like, oh, you have to meet Oliver. She brings in her little dog in a little uh, Ralph Lauren t-shirt. Um, and she puts him on my lap. And <laughs> we're, want him we're in the lap? middle of the exam though. So I'm like, is this professional? But maybe this is a good thing. Maybe she knows that I don't, I'm not comfortable with the dentist. So I'm just trying to make me comfortable. I couldn't make sense of it. I'm going to opt for, she was trying to make me comfortable. And or what's the other option? She's not inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, she's inappropriate. I don't know. That's where I was going with it. But I think I think she brought in the, the human nature aspect. And I think I'm going to give her a shot. Thank you, <laughs> dear uh, Marissa. listener. Marissa. Marissa. Marissa? Yes. Marissa. So this is a great time to remind our listeners. But do you think that's the right choice? I don't need your <laughs> external validation. Let's ask our listeners. Maybe they'll uh, we'll do a poll. But that is kind of odd, Ooh, right? I mean. It is kind of odd, yes. I mean, uh, my and first then, thought would be, is the like, dog clean? Like, no, I don't know. it was. It smelled okay. clean, but then it kept licking, like, it tried to lick my mouth, and I was like, no, that's, I don't know you well enough, and then it licked my ears, <laughs> and then I was just like, I'm done, but then she was like, do you want Oliver to stay with you for the rest of it? I was like, no, I think he wants to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a great opportunity <laughs> to remind our listeners to continue to send your questions, comments, stories, reviews to Monica and Michael at Spiritually Hungry dot life. Monica and Michael at Spiritually Hungry dot life. We read all of your emails. They inspire us. We read, of course, many of them and they inspire the rest of our listeners. So please continue to send all of your questions, comments, topics, ideas to Monica and Michael at Spiritually Hungry dot life. And as always, please share this podcast with everybody you know, as Rissa did with all of our patients, with all of your friends, with all of your family. And we continue to record this podcast because of all these great stories that we hear and the inspiration that hopefully it brings to so many of our listeners. And go to Apple Podcasts, write five-star reviews, and share it with the whole world. Thank you for that. And we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording. Stay spiritually hungry. <laughs>